It's Jody Sabatino, abstract paintings.com. With a DI. Yeah, there it is. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, um, neat. That's the home page. Oh, neat. And that's a recent one, this Chinese kind of one. I'm doing one. Oh, I thought those were yours. They're all mine. Oh, no, beautiful. I'm, they're his. Mine. It's just a Chinese influence. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a little bit about me. Hey, you know, I didn't go to art school and I so I couldn't put anything like that in there. So yeah, I just cool. I just did something original. Hi, I'm a painter. So each day is a fresh canvas inviting me to fill it with color, visual mystery, hints from unseen worlds, surprising patterns that please or shock the eye. I've been attending art school since this magical spring day. I'm 18 months old, staring at the glowing daffodils and tulips through the rungs of my playpen with my mother hangs wash on the lawn. I'm captivated by the flower garden, shimmering electric reds, yellows, greens, and the sea of sky blue. They still are. You like that? You're going to be famous, Joe. That's beautiful. And then the links here, uh, small paintings. Um, small paintings with photos. Yeah, so these are small paintings. Uh, I think I'll put like seven to a page, then it goes to another page. And then uh, large paintings. Oh, that is very nice, Joe. Yeah. That was a big to steep, do learn this. Yeah. steep learning curve, but I figured it out. It's WordPress. And then um, uh, people have to contact me to buy a painting. They have to email me. Uh, and then I put some fun photos about me here, uh, a little bit about <clears throat> how I got into painting. But there are some recent photos <laughs> uh, I put <laughs> me. That's, that's uh, Trader Joe's decaf coffee, if you know who I am. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I lost a thumbnail recently. I got a fungus infection. I think it could have been from paint. So I'm I'm starting to wear gloves just to protect my hands. You know? Oh no! And um, yeah, and then um, uh, currently I live in North Myrtle Beach, walking distance from the beach where I paint full time, teach an art appreciation class on Zoom, I lead a weekly mindfulness meditation class at a yoga center, and play my classical guitar at least an hour a day. And there I am. <laughs> Oh, uh, with a with a paper cut out I did, and I sold that the other day, which is cool. Oh, you all, and then second thing, you all know how to, or you're interested in knowing how to download from YouTube um, videos or music. Do you know how to do that? Are you interested? Hi, Cheryl. Do you want me to show Hi. you real? Quick? I can't believe that you posting that you're showing us this right now. I can't believe it because just either yesterday or this morning, I thought. I want to ask him how he started painting. All oh, right, there it is. I right can't there. believe it because you've done so many things in your life, and it just seemed to me just just in the last three or four years you started painting. But you, uh, you had the painter's eye from your playpen, looking out while your mother was hanging <laughs> off the cat blows. Uh, and it's oh, hey, this is so cool. Uh, the psychologist, uh, who's a contemporary of Freud and Jung, uh, uh, don't I can't think of his name. He said your earliest memory is significant. It's like a life myth. Uh, what's your earliest wow. memory? There's a reason you remember that. Out of everything that happened to you in childhood, there's a reason. And that's my earliest memory. It's a spring day. I must have been, it must have been 1949, um, April or May. Wow. And, I'm the, and my mother's hanging wash and the garden, uh, daffodils and tulips. And and it was like I was on LSD. It's like you, the way you see the world, the, the, the tulips <laughs> and daffodils were electric, they're glowing. And and I never, that's my earliest memory. And so, yeah. And so that's a wow. uh, that's the earliest memory has some, will have something to do with your life myth. So obviously for me, color and being, you know, um, fascinated mm -hmm. by color and, and yeah. So, but then I started painting in Interesting. college. I started painting in college by seeming accident. I don't know if I told you this. At the start of my sophomore year, I registered for what I mistakenly thought was an art appreciation course. I walked into class the first day and was surprised to see numerous easels in the room, students preparing to paint. I almost left, but the instructor convinced me to give it painting a go. I discovered I had a natural sense of color harmony and it felt like I had painted before and was picking up where I left off. My untutored style was impressionistic. Right. So that's how I started. Wow. It was a quote unquote accident. <laughs> I had never painted before. All right. So. Uh, yeah, so that's my website. Um, pass around to people if you want. Uh, and then, so my other question was, 
Does do you want to know how to download a, a really free software where you can download videos and music from uh, YouTube? It's a specializes YouTube. Anybody? Yes. That's where I get yes, my videos. Yes. Want, yes. want me to show you right now? Is that it? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you Google. Um, uh, it's for it's called 4K YouTube Downloader, right? Uh, 4K YouTube Downloader. There it is. Right. It's a free software. 4K video downloader, right? Uh, there it is. Free video downloader, trusted by millions. It's, a, it's the it's the best one out. There's several, but this is the best one. See it? Okay, so you go there and you download it. All right. Uh, and um, what it looks like when it opens up, and when you got it on your on your computer. This will all be on your recording, right? Yeah. So it looks like this. So what you do is you go to a, you go to any YouTube. Um, let me go there in fact first. You go to any YouTube. Uh, once you got it on your hard drive, and you go to you go to YouTube, and just pick anything uh, that you want. Music. Okay. Uh, okay. YouTube. So and this is so cool. And I'll tell you why. Um, so. Uh, best toenail clippers, then no, we don't want that one. Uh, let's say, let's get some music. Um, let's do music. Uh, doesn't matter to anybody. Billie Eilish, before she became famous. All right, so once, you, once that comes up on your YouTube, you, you copy it. You see where it says copy? Copy it. And then you go back to uh, this, and it says paste link. And it's automatically copying it. All right, so you have a choice to set it for, um, I have it set for MP3, okay? But you can down, so you have a choice um, to, here, you've got a choice when you go under tools, you can, you can download just the audio, it'll strip the audio out of the video, or you can download the video with the, with the sound under, that's MP4. So MP3 is sound only, MP4 is the video plus sound. So you, you choose which one, I have it for MP3. So that, so that song, just download it, Billy Eilish without the video, here it is. And it's really fast, you saw how quick it took. It'll come up in a second. Here it is, on my hard drive. It on YouTube a second ago. I'm going to play. Okay, so then I have, uh, I've got a flash drive. Um, and what I do is, so if you go, to, you got to say show and folder, the song, and uh, here it is in the folder. You can only copy it in the folder. So then I copy it. Uh, I copy the MP3, say copy, and then I put the flash drive in my computer, right? And I transfer it to the flash drive. And this all takes minutes, right? So if I go here. Um, so it's here, copy in, in, in the downloader. And then I go to where the flash drive is um, here. Um, USB, it's a, it's a USB. And then I just paste it in. Really, I was singing before, okay. Um, so all, if you have a flash drive, which is nothing but music, then if you have an MP, MP3 uh, Bluetooth player, do you, have, do you have one of those, everybody? No. Oh, wait, one, wait, one wait one second, wait one second. Yeah. I am nowhere near Joe in techie ability. <laughs> it's enough I get on here each week. I love your phrase, techie ability. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> so, so I'm in your basket. Can you, can you see? Um, can you see this? It's a. Um, um, can you see that? This is a. This is a ten dollar. Um, um, a Bluetooth speaker, right? So I've got the the songs I downloaded from from YouTube. The just the audios are on this are on this um, right there or on this thumb drive. You put it in here. This has a USB port, this little cheap $10, and you turn it on, listen to it, it's amazing sound. And these are songs I've downloaded, maybe different songs. 
Let's just play for a second. All right. Yeah. So I've got a whole. Yeah. Down. So I've got a whole playlist that are, that's on this uh, flash drive, and you can change it every day. You can, and this also this uh, 4K downloader. You can download whole albums. There's albums on there from YouTube. You just download the whole album and then you put it on flash drive and you can play with this habits in your house. And I, while, while I'm painting, I, I just create a, a playlist, jazz, whatever. And, um, and then you can delete it. You're bored with it. You listen to it for a couple of days. You delete all the songs off this and you just add new ones. So uh, for this class, a lot of the videos of what I do is I've downloaded them onto the 4K video downloader. So they're off the internet and on my hard drive, okay? Although I, I don't think the sound is as great, so I'm showing them live on YouTube. But but as a backup, if the if the something happens, I've got it on on this 4K video downloader. You can bring it in, you can put this in your car and play, or just have it playing in your house. You create your own list, and it's so fast. So, but um, these things, these uh, Bluetooth speakers, you can get them anywhere. Get them at Walmart. It's twenty dollars. This one's a, this one's only ten. I get paint all over it, so I want to buy an expensive one. But, uh, where, this, where did you find the ten dollar one, Joe? Oh, at Roses. Bluetooth. Wow. Rose is right off the corner from us, and they've got a, they got a selection of them. This was ten bucks, and they got a really nice sound, so it's fine for me. Anyway, I want to share that with you because most that's, people know know about that. That's great, thank you, Joe. And what is the name of your website? Whatever you just uh, showed before. Yeah, right? My name, Joe DeSabatino Abstract Paintings dot com, all one word. Joe DeSabatino Abstract Paintings dot com. Right. Joe, thank you for all the info about the music, but I have an iPad, so I can't do any of that. Oh, I see. Well, uh, your iPad doesn't take flash drives? No. Nope. Okay. All right. So, yes, I'll turn my phone. Uh, yeah. right. Pan, I guess you'll just have to break down and get a computer for a laptop. <laughs> uh, you don't need a... No, no. Um, wait, wait a second. Uh, oh, you you can't download on you can't download uh, videos onto your onto your. Um... Yes, I could, but the then the storage is a problem on the iPad. Okay. okay all right. Thank you. I can I I can go and listen to stuff. So thank. You. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is mainly for PCs, I guess. Yeah. All right. So it should be an interesting class today. We're going to look at um, uh, contemporary Chinese artists, and I'll start with. Um, um, I found a page with 10 significant Chinese artists. Uh, we only get to about five, five of them. Uh, hold on, six of them. Uh, so hold on, let me find it. Uh, there's a great documentary that's gonna take an hour uh, by one of them, it's really fantastic. So, um, okay, so we'll start with Al. Uh, no, the case, where are they, hold on. Here it is. Artists who define. Great. Can you all see that? Yeah. Ten, yes. ar ten artists who define Chinese uh, contemporary art. Uh, first name there you see is I Y Y. We'll we'll look at him first. He's the most well known. And uh, right. yeah, so you probably heard of him. But here's others. Okay. So I can't. I don't. It's hopeless trying to pronounce them. Um, so. Um, he, so Guggenheim, the Guggenheim had a survey card art in China after 1989, uh, the, the Tiananmen Square thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, was people in there. Um, so uh, he's one of the artists. And then there's this guy, Huang Yongping. There you go. There's an example. Huang uh, Yong. An installation he does. Um, he did. He's the oldest artist on the list, and um, uh, here's a first generation of art students to attend this Academy of Fine Arts, now the China Academy of Art, where universities reopened after the Cultural Revolution. Okay, uh, he's one of this guy. I should have a video. I feature him, Yang Fudang. He does video art, and he's he is the godfather of video art in China, Yang Fudong, um, and then. This one, Zheng Fan Zai, born in 64, lives in, born in Wuhan. 
a uh, few contemporary artists oh. at auction as, as Feng Feng Zhai. Okay. Uh, he's, um, yeah. Uh, Joe, can you ask everybody to, to mute? Because oh, yeah, it... yeah, can you all mute, please? So um, that's it. Mute your, that's it. Good. He's been influenced by Bacon, William de Cooney, Max Beckman. Uh, so. And then there's only one woman in this list. Zhu Zen, uh, born in 77 from Shanghai. Uh, uh, contemporary art calls everything into question, including his identity, country, and art industry at large. You know, right after Tiananmen, right before Tiananmen Square, after the Cultural Resolu Revolution in the 70s fizzled out, there was a period when, when the window opened and China was pretty tolerant of artists and protests and and it kept growing. And then that's why Tiananmen Square, uh, Square happened because it was they, the authorities felt it was getting out of hand and they squashed it. And so um, there, there was a period there, maybe six, seven years when there's more freedom uh, for artists to do all kinds of art and protests than ever. And it's been all, it's, it's getting worse and worse. So, uh, okay, so, and then we'll look at this guy, Lu Dong. he's one of the, uh, he may be chi China's greatest living painter. He's an incredible painter, um, given an especial achievement, given how popular painting remains is there, okay? Um, and then the man, uh, this guy, Chao Fei, uh, 78, lives and works in Beijing. He's the youngest uh, and only Chinese commissioned to create a BMW art car, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then Zhang Wan uh, looks a little bit like... Uh, Yoko Ono's kind of work. <laughs> He's the most radical artist in contemporary, Chinese contemporary art. Um, Yang once covered himself in honey and fish oil and sat naked in a public toilet, <laughs> allowing himself to be covered in flies, an expression of the poverty. In oh, God. In Is he still allowed to do this kind of art? I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I doubt it. Maybe, as long as it's not uh, uh, criticizing the government, I think they'll accept that. Okay. Um, and then Zhu Bing uh, lives and works in Beijing. He's a printmaker, um, language, uh, best known works as books from the sky, it looks like that. Uh, and audacious text creating using 4,000 characters that adhere to the fundamental of Chinese pictographic composition, but don't exist in the Chinese language, blah, blah, blah. And then the, the documentary we're going to see um, is Chao Guang Zhang. You ever hear of him? The sky, the sky ladder, and he's a gunpowder artist. He does. I think you showed it, uh, Joe. Yeah, yeah. So he's a fireworks artist. I did at the end, but the, uh, he does many different things. So um, he's um, so. Anyway, Netflix has been featuring the documentary Sky Ladder: The Art of Chai Guo Zhang. Okay, it was released in two sixteen. So we'll watch that. Okay. All right, so let's start uh, probably the, the one, the artist who is known for his um, protests and, and challenging the Chinese government and paying a huge price for it. He's been beaten, he's been arrested, he's done time in jail. He, uh, he's been fined millions of dollars. Um, they just look for every way the Chinese government to harass him. Um, it's it's IYY. Uh, so, all, have all those things happened? He's, they say he lives in New York. No, he's, he's, he, lived in New York. he lived in New York uh, after art school for about five, six years. And then he in 1995, back. Chinese artists. And he went back to China where, where he still is. Oh. He's, all, he's brave. He's courageous, man. He's always um, challenged. Since, since he moved back is when he's been beaten and fined huge amounts and put in jail. Uh, no, he, did, he didn't move back to the States. He, but he... he, he did installations about his uh, his imprisonment and and um, and being beaten up. He did installations in Europe about that, but he was still there. Still lives in China, as far as I know. In 1995, Chinese artist Ai Weiwei photographed himself as he picked up a 2,000-year-old urn and let it smash to the ground. If we're appalled when cultural heritage is destroyed in the name of God and state, how can we possibly defend Ai's action? How can we buy a ticket to see photos of it in a museum? How can those photos sell for over a million dollars? How can this man be one of the most renowned artists of our time? This is the case for Ai Weiwei. 
Ai Weiwei was born in Beijing in 1957 to writer Gao Ying and famed poet Ai Qing, whom communist leader Mao Zedong initially embraced but soon after denounced during the anti-rightist movement of 1958. The family was exiled to labor camps in remote provinces until the end of the Cultural Revolution in 1976. They then returned to Beijing and Ai, and by that I mean Ai Weiwei, enrolled in Beijing Film Academy in 1978 and co-founded a group of avant-garde artists called The Stars. In 1981, he decamped to the U.S. and settled in New York, where he scraped by, hung out with his neighbor, renowned beat poet Allen Ginsberg, and took lots and lots of pictures. He also immersed himself in art, studying Marcel Duchamp and considering the idea of the ready-made as a way to make art. When he returned to China in 1993, he met with a country undergoing tremendous change. Many were still reeling from the 1989 Tiananmen Square crackdown on pro-democracy demonstrators, and Deng Xiaoping's focus on economic development had tripped off the massive transformation of China's cities. Ai's urn dropping occurred not long after his return, but his irreverence had surfaced before that. He turned a critical eye toward all edifices of power, at home as well as abroad. Well versed in antiques, he knew the value of historic objects and the symbolic power of manipulating them. Chinese antiquities became eyes raw material for a new kind of ready-made, dynamically synthesizing the clash between reverence for the past and the irrepressible drive toward the future. For modernization is a mixed bag. With change, there is loss. History is erased. How can we condemn an artist for destroying cultural heritage when his government has raised neighborhoods? and entire cities to build new roads, buildings, giant dams, and Olympic stadiums. Ai's work allows us to reckon with the destruction that construction requires. But to be clear, he is more of a creator than destroyer. He has repurposed wood from demolished temples and transformed it into intricate and dramatic installations. He takes a basic unit, say an antique stool, and multiplies it, compounds it, to see where it takes us. History that would otherwise be relegated to dusty shops or landfills is made strikingly, unforgettably visible. And he has found new uses for old techniques, hiring craftspeople adept in ancient joinery traditions. He has enlisted the most skilled porcelain makers in the world to demonstrate their mastery, commissioning exquisitely made copies and objects like watermelons, crabs, and millions and millions of sunflower seeds. He has embraced the handmade within an- uh, sunflower seed exhibit. Okay, 100 million uh, and had thousands of, he was paying, you know, peasants to paint them over two years. And he just filled the floor the, at the, where it was in New York, Guggenheim, other places, I don't know, four feet deep with these ceramic sunflower seeds. And you just walk in in your, in your socks or bare feet and just kind of immerse yourself. And sun, sunflowers, he said, are, are, everyone eats sunflower seeds in China, rich or poor, it's part of the culture. So it's it's a statement about that, and also the symbolism of the sunflower, et cetera, et cetera. But it's it's like one of the things he does, like when he does one, he'll take some one object and multiply it millions of times, and to you know so an economy whose incredible growth has been fueled by automation and mass production. He has synthesized traditionally Chinese materials to think about the part in relationship to the whole, the self in relationship to the collective. If a nation cannot face its past, he has said, it has no future. And Ai is equally concerned with the present. In 2008, when the Sichuan earthquake struck, he visited the region in the immediate aftermath and assembled volunteers to gather the names of the dead, addressing attempts by authorities to cover up the disproportionate number of school children who died because of poorly built schools. He amassed tons of twisted rebar from the wreckage, painstakingly straightened it, and assembled it into spare elegiac memorials. He arranged 9,000 backpacks on the facade of the Haus der Kunst in Munich to represent the young lives lost, spelling out a quote from a victim's mother. She lived happily for seven years in this world. I has been a ceaseless, unflagging voice for the voiceless. In 2009, he was beaten and detained in his hotel room in Chengdu when attempting to testify in the trial of human rights activist Tan Zuaren. He visits with refugees fleeing the war in Syria, organized a London Walk of Compassion in their honor, covered his sculptures with thermal blankets, and wrapped the columns of Berlin's concert hall with salvaged refugee life vests. An early adherent of social media, he is an adamant supporter of free speech. He reports on his life in minute detail. He did so up until his 2011 arrest and confinement for 81 days on unfounded tax evasion charges, as well as after. Authorities have demolished his Shanghai studio, threatened to demolish his Beijing studio, and forced him to pay a tax evasion fine of 15 million yuan. He has been continually surveilled and followed, prevented from leaving his country, and through it all has refused censorship, 
within China as well as abroad. Not everything he does is genius, but he remains committed to reaching an ever wider public. His work does not sit firmly in the realm of art, but radiates out. He's often called an iconoclast, and an urn crusher would certainly seem to adhere to the definition. But there's another way to see Ai Weiwei, as someone who desperately wants the cherished beliefs and institutions of China's past to be remembered and resuscitated. And in that sense, as radicals go, he's brilliantly conservative. His work is deeply rooted in history and tradition. It is steeped in remembering, valuing, preserving. He stands defiantly opposed to a culture that wants to move on with little regard for the past. He is resistance to forgetting, to silence. His work asks us to consider what we value, why we value it, and what we are accountable for destroying, preserving, or transforming. He asks fundamental questions about our human rights and responsibilities. Liberty, he says, is about our rights to question everything. Out of a source of constant irritation, the oyster develops a pearl. I is that constant source of irritation, and we are lucky not only to bear witness to it, but to be called to action by it. Yeah. Um, that was great. Yeah. Does Does Angela know about all these people? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what she. I, I haven't discussed that with her. She's you. online, but I don't know if she's. No, I don't know. Actively but, online. Yeah, so you got to admire, admire his courage, and his originality as an artist too, which is um, he's a great artist. Um, and working so in, in um, uh, lots of different media. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, I got a couple of short videos about him. Here's a fun flower seed. Uh, I guess you do keep your shoes on. Mm -hmm. Like being on a beat with those stands, ceramic something.
Any um, any thoughts or reflections on that? I thought it was delightful to see all the different ways that people were reacting to and relating to the sunflower seeds, yeah. all the different archetypes. You know, the business, the business, the curator walking through at one point, right. the guy lying down and snuggling into the sunflower seeds. The 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 woman who was sitting with a guy on the ground in the sunflowers, like this, just taking a disputation on the you know, the theory of what this all meant, you know, I mean, just different people doing different things. I thought it made me laugh most of the time. Yeah. Now there's humor in it. Um, yeah. Anybody else, any thoughts? I have a few thoughts for this. Anyone else? Um, pro or con, I don't care. Do people take his sunflowers? I don't think so. Sunflower I think seeds? Um, maybe not legally. I, I, okay. It's the money in their pocket. I'm sure that happens. Yeah. But I think it's a hundred million. And right. he's mistakenly painted by these, he taught these peasant women and men how to do it. And each one yeah. is uh, labored over and it, very precise, you know, and uh, size. Um, some of the thoughts I have is like um, God's creation, a hundred billion stars, you know, it's all mm -hmm. like a repetition, this infinite, huge number of repetition stars. And so it's like, it's like playing God, you know, just repeating this one thing or, or yeah. sand on the beach. And so there's that. And usually art is something out there in front of you. Don't touch it, you know, uh, up yeah. on the wall or, or uh, an object. Don't touch that. Just look at it. And here it's beneath you. It's under your feet and you can sit in it and walk, you know. And, and so it's a whole different perspective mm -hmm. uh, on just the idea of an seemingly infinite number of one tiny little thing. And I got thinking, well, it's like human souls, you know, like, uh, maybe mm -hmm. each special unique sunflower seed represents a human being you know in, in the world mm -hmm. and, um i don't know you could go i guess those would be my reflections where i was sitting in that <laughs> yeah yeah um, yeah uh you know definitely defies our conventional ideas about what art is right yeah <laughs> he does that all the time uh let's see here and he to do and he's a really he's a really delightful human being. I really like him. Uh, and this, here's a brief interview. Oh, I know one of the exhibits, um, you could talk and you could ask him a question. And I don't know if he's answering it live, but the questions are recorded and then he answers them. That's what this is. You can ask him a question about anything about the exhibit. And it shows him answering the question. This is from the tape. Yo, oh wee oui, wee, oui, what do you think to this? <laughs> yeah, it's the visitors today ask my question. 11,000 pounds. That's pretty cool. Sunflower seeds is the most common object in China. No wonder where you are or, or poor or rich or remote area or in the city. What was your reaction when you first saw your work installed in the turbine? I was quite shocked. I mean, that's uh, something about the artwork. It's nothing you really just can talk about it. You have to really experience it. How long did it take to make this? The total length is about uh, two and a half years. I know you are in your I you I just wondered if you think that a work like Sunflower Seeds will be exhibited in China in your lifetime. Nobody knows how long this uh, political situation in China will uh, stay and uh, takes how long for them to change, for them to truly understand 
the value of、um, creativity. Second, I don't know how long I will live. How does it feel seeing all these people's different perspectives to your artwork? I think、um, that is a chance for artists to understand the work even to understand how a work can be. Expressed and、uh, how it has its own life. This kind of explanation, I think, is a very interesting explanation. Do you consider your sunflower seeds to be one piece of art or a hundred million pieces of art?、Uh, sunflower seeds is one piece. Of art, which contains 100 million pieces of art. I created a piece of music to go with the sunflower exhibition. Here we go. I think it's wonderful. Thank you, Y Y, wherever you are, and I would love to roll around in it and just feel the experience. It has expanded my consciousness. Thank you. I'm very happy you you like the work, and I think the work is really made for you. Thank you. It's so original. <clears throat> Let's see here.、Um, um, I love it that people were allowed to ask him questions and、yeah. and, and and then it taped his the questions and the answers. I think that's fabulous. Right. <clears throat> so thirteen works to know. There's the sunflower seeds. He worked in everything from paint to ready-made.、Uh, so there's an exhibit. I don't know where was it.、Um, what was this?、Uh, I think we got it on UK somewhere.、Uh, from 1993 to 2000, still alive.、Um, let's see. Did this is an early one.、Uh, back with stone, old stones, dating back to Chinese Stone Age. Again, just sheer numbers.、Um, <clears throat> A little more. There he is dropping in the valuable vase, <laughs>、uh, right?、Uh, and he he designed, you know, the Olympics, the Bird's Nest Stadium.、Uh, that's his design. <clears throat> he regrets doing it now. He boycotted the Olympics. But、uh, you're familiar with this? It's a very original design. <laughs>、um, okay, fragments.、Uh, He salvaged pillars and beams of、uh, Tilai Chinese ironwood from demolished Jing Dynasty temples, and worked with carpenters to create a structure of poles with linking arms.、Uh, mark out, and also look from above.、Uh, the anchored poles mark out the borders of a map of China. <clears throat> All right, this one is those、um, uh, of wooden doors and windows. We saw that earlier. Salvaged from Ming and Qing Dynasty houses. Which had been demolished to make way for new development, right? So,、uh, this is called、uh, Fountain of Light, shown at the Tate in Liverpool in 2007. It's a tiered chandelier of glass crystals, 20 feet high. It was inspired by Vladimir Tallinn's ambitious communist monument in Russia, the monument for the Third International Blah Blah Blah.、Right? So, it must be cool to look at from different angles. I would think too if it had light coming in from the top, it would be doing some cool stuff. And this is the、uh, from the、uh, earthquake and the steel rods that he had straightened out as a memorial to the thousands of students dead. And the Chinese government did cover up.、Um, these schools schools were poorly made, so Chinese government does not like him doing this at all. And then this is the one with the nine、uh, thousand、uh, school children's backpacks, different colors. To depict the sentence for seven years, she lived happily on Earth in Chinese lettering.、Okay. So just to keep that memory alive of all the children that perished in that earthquake. Here's the sunflower seeds.、Um, let's see, 
It took 1,600 artisans over two years to make the seeds, which were created out of a kaolin from local mountains, clay, kaolin clay, hand painted and fired at 1,300 degrees. So a lot of these people got, got work. I mean, they were paid. So uh, this is uh, uh, he, his incarceration. And, and these, it's like a view, you can view this from standing outside these rooms and, and they see him, um, it's done in fiberglass. That's him, fiberglass, the Chinese military arresting him. And there's different scenes from his. So that's his way of showing what happened to him. But this was done not in China, naturally. Uh, uh, wherever it was done, I'm not sure. Um, so again, they don't like him doing that. <laughs> uh, this is cool. This is like, um, uh, bicycles, call it uh, Forever Bicycles, and it's a it's a play on uh, Duchamp, who did a he did a bicycle wheel, so he does it a thousand times. Uh, it's a one thousand one hundred seventy nine stainless steel bicycle frames held together in geometrical shapes. It forever it refers to the Forever Bicycle brand. That's the name of a brand of bicycles which has been producing bikes in Shanghai since nineteen forty. So yeah, it's called Forever Bicycles, right? So that, you know that's one of his. Uh, what he's known for, just um, doing thousands of one thing <laughs> to really bring it home. Uh, this is uh, 6,000 stools laid out in the gallery, antique stools, because uh, what the Chinese were do doing was replacing the traditional wooden stool with metal and plastic. So again, it's, he wants to preserve the past and show the beauty of these simple item, uh, this three, um, three legged stool, you know, which is it was everywhere in China. Now it's plastic, but um, you know, just do it thousands of times. Uh, and let's see, this was a woman, Yi Haiyan, uh, uh, an activist for women's rights in China. Uh, the Chinese government evicted her from her home, leaving her, her daughter, and their luggage on the side of a motorway. Bai has helped Yo Haiyan financially since she became homeless and eventually turned her hastily packed belongings into an artwork. So those are her belongings. Just, uh, yeah. All right, so that's, I think I have one more here. Um, Let's just give you a sense of the kind of things he does. Uh, yeah, this is New York, uh, enormous art installation. He brings, uh, aims to bring home the horrors of the refugees. Crime. And it's the whole theme on the wall. And this was done throughout the city. And this was at the time, 2017, when um, Trump was you know, really going home, getting the, the wall with Mexico. And there's a reference always when you think about the China, wall of China. Um, something, that, something there is that doesn't love a wall, wrote Robert Frost in his 1914 poem, Mending Wall, in which the narrator's neighbor insists on a barrier between their two properties. He offers the maxim, good fences make good neighbors. The narrator responds by planning a question, why do they make good neighbors? Against the backdrop of an unprecedented refugee crisis and global waves of isolation and sediment, uh, why, why, like Frost narrator, ask that same question, advocating for connection in a massive project taking place throughout New York City and named after the, the neighbor's proverb, op, uh, proverb. Opening Thursday, good fences make good neighbors is organized by blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Okay, so he's got these different types of walls and fences all around the city. Uh, <clears throat> Right, build a cage, which makes the form of a gargantuan bird cage with an open top. And the first thing we saw was an arch here, uh, right? Open arch. Um, right. the The project's opening follows by just a few days uh, Trump's latest bid to secure funding for a wall on the USS Southern Board. The public art piece also comes in a rocky debate over public statuary, namely mon Confederate monuments that is touched on what sorts of people should be commemorated on public grounds. So yeah, so all, he did all different all different types of installations throughout the city. I think that was in 2017. Yep. So he's all over the world, but he has had a big impact on New York art. All right, so that's him. So there's so many. This again, this is just the tip of the iceberg of his work. I mean, you can. I'll find more online. Um, all right, next one I have is cuisine. <laughs> uh, here we go. Journeys without arrivals.
Chejo J is an artist and a producer, a teacher, um, a student, a curator. He's a master with a capital M um, on calligraphy. He's one of the most uh, respected calligraphers in China. And then through that he became and he got interested into developing the work in an incredible variety of forms. Calligraphy is the starting point of his work and you can see it coming back everywhere. The educational part of his life is extremely, extremely important. Uh, he always says that um, without teaching he wouldn't be a good artist and without being a good artist he wouldn't be a good father. And I think it's a beautiful way of expressing who he is, right? That is not um, about the ego, but it's about the sharing and about the caring. And I think that is also something that people will enjoy in this show because uh, people will feel that there is truth about it. This exhibition, my title the title of this exhibition is called Junior Bazaar Survivor. In Chinese, it's可以一成这个没有终点的旅途但是我们最后决定把它一成不羁之旅这个羁呢是以前那个控制码的方向的东西所以就说它那个没有确定的目的地的这个意思这个可能比较准确这个标题可能是比较准确的描述了整个展览的
Usually when I, when I talk about um, artists like Zhou Zhou Zhe, I never say that he's a Chinese artist, I always say that he's an artist from China. Um, and there is a huge difference in the way of saying that, because um, if, you, if, if you say a Chinese artist, you ethnographically um, put in a, you know, whatever it creates as a sort of a bubble, you know, of a cultural bubble. And when you talk about an artist that comes from somewhere, then you just connotate the artist you know, with a geographical sort of starting point. And, um, and Chojo Jie is, of course, completely Chinese in that sense, um, as, a, as a cultural human being, but he's been also part of a globalized world that you know, he created who he is in 30 years of his careers and development. This education is always important. 是因为我在通过教学我不断的在学习在自我更新在更新自己那么花很多时间来教学对我来说绝不是浪费的时间而是一个学习的时间因为实际上我把教师是给定义成一个学习的组织者就是我永远只教自己不太懂的东西那么这
Reminds me of that uh, but It goes on like that. So uh, what I get is it's a dreamscape. These people are in this strange urban area. They don't know where they are. They, they have suitcases. They're traveling. Uh, they seem lost. There's this sense of um, seriousness or maybe dread that comes with the music, uh, like something ominous could happen at any time. Um, there's no logical connection between like the different scenes, but it, it all adds up to be, you know, it's, it's evocative um, and poetic in a way. So it could be commentary. I'm thinking on um, the new China, it's called the first spring, where people, it's like a whole strange landscape that the new China has created in these urban areas that people feel, um, where am I? Which is about this one possibility. Um, so I just want to give you a taste of that. And here's him talking about his work. Uh, He said he paints with, with his camera. <clears throat> 就有时候可以说开玩笑说你是一个就是用电影机。画画的用影像画画的一个艺术家大的一个影像电影对我来说的话不同的主题我觉得它会有一些潜在的东西可能是
是人本身的一些所谓精神生活是潜在的，就是脱离表面的物质生活或者日常生活。因为我觉得《第五页》这个作品，可能就是自己一一系列的空间电影创作当中的其中一部。《第五页》这个作品从电影过程当中汲取的就是电影镜头的这种不同的运用的过程，电影镜头运用的不同的方式方法，然后在这里边进行一个所谓的一个新的一个叙事的一个尝试。然后有点像一个长卷的绘画。你比如说七，它一共用七台电影机，然后同时进行拍摄，它可能是有陌生的、距离有距离感、呃、孤独的。或者说是夜间的这种，就是电影厂的这种空间独有的这种声音，然后所有这些就希望构成一个像是一个午夜诗歌这么一个状态。然后其实，在自己最早拍片子的时候，基本上很很难会去找专业演员。然后很多时候都是朋友，或者是朋友的朋友。你像在《竹林七贤》里边，很多都是非专业的，还有很多都是美术学院的朋友。他有时候好的演员，他会超出你想象的范围，他做的可能比你想象还要好，或者给你提供更多的选择。然后我觉得这个时候是一种非常美妙的时刻，所以我觉得跟演员的这种互动的时候，我会觉得是一种非常美好的电影生活。因为其实每次拍东西的时候，呃，发生的事情都会不一样。你像《新女性二》里边那个马的事情，所以很多时候，因为马他也是演员，然后你很难控制，你不知道他会突然间会做什么。你要尊重自己的直觉，最快的做出决定是拍还是不拍。然后这个时候可能没有任何的第二次机会。去村往东，然后这个六个屏幕的影像装置，嗯，可能这个是自己老家的记忆，就是童年的记忆。所以那时候记忆里面，北方的冬天就是非常寒冷，然后都是这种什么，就是刮风啊、下雪呀、啊，然后到处都是村子周围都是狗叫。因为这里面所有出现的狗，全在在某种意义上，这些狗全都是演员，他们其实是我们购买的一批像流浪狗的狗的演员。等于就是每天会带着这些狗，然后出去去不同的地方，然后去拍摄。其实很难说它是一个纪录片，在在我看来，它可能是有一点点像纪录片的电影，或者是一个伪纪录片电影。我自己觉得这这部作品并不是跟政治有关系的，然后会觉得可能就是一个。自己童年记忆的一个思考，或者是对社会、社会生活的一种思考，就还是都在做自己比较喜欢做的事情。我觉得这点上来说，我还是蛮开心的。然后自己可能也有很多的所谓的电影计划或者大的计划
，或者是是很多就大大小小吧，就是自己都是在内心当中，然后对未来或者对很多想要做的事情充满期待。我觉得这种，这种生活，然后这种期待是非常美好的。Yeah. Uh, all the original unique way of、uh, making a film,、uh, not your conventional dialogue and interactions.、Um, so I would think sitting, maybe sitting through those for an hour or two hours, it would.、Um, I don't know what would happen, but I would imagine you would kind of go into some altered state, and maybe get a sense of the characters or the actors,、um, like you said, the inner life, their inner feelings,、um, and then you kind of start. But then it's all projection on your part. They're not saying anything. I mean, there's background music, there's some noises and sounds from your part. They're not saying anything, so it's an open、um, field for you to project feelings on. You know, these are just stimulants for them, and. and And yeah, so totally, totally make way to make a film. All right,、um, here's this painter who I really like, Liu Zhangdang,、um, and then we'll go to that documentary. I really love this guy's painting.、Um, Okay. Oh no, let me skip him. Um, just for time, I'm gonna skip him. Go to the other person. Let's lose him. This guy. We are in fact outside of、uh, the exhibition of Liu Xiaodong. The title is "Painting as Shooting," and the title is quite clear. It's not about death, killing people, but about the fact that his way of working as a painter is not a traditional practice of an artist going every day in his studio and covering a canvas. He's working as a filmmaker, as a writer, as a journalist, as a way you would do your work yourself, making the investigation. Going on site, meeting people, diving into the reality, setting up the studio, then putting the casting of people he found for the, the, the thing in front of him in the right location, then painted as a performance, and all the process is、uh, recorded. First, he writes a story, then makes the drawings, preparatory drawings, then everything is filmed by. Filmmakers. I've been working on the last for the last thirty years. I've been recorded, and all those elements, all those documents, make each work as the work, and not just as the finalized thing with the painting. But everything must exist as a whole, and this is what we wanted to show here for the first time in the West: an exhibition of that scale, showing not just one series, but. Na extract of nine different series that he has done throughout the last ten years in different locations around the world. Often it's what's missing in, for me in shows, and here we want to reveal that all those works are connected to context, to situations, to、uh, realities, and not just about、uh, beautiful things painted on the wall and things like this. So, of course, it has this. This double uh, uh, level, we could say, or several uh, levels mm. of uh, readings. So we wanted to pro to provide to the viewers the possibility to enter to the wo this world and enter into different perspective, different、uh, dimensions, different.、Uh, so you go, you start from Cuba. Then you have. Bangkok, you have、uh, two different places in China where one has an earthquake problem in 2008, and, and another one in Tibet. 
So you go around in the first room within this. So you are not just in one world. Venice is a global platform, especially during the Venice Biennale or any Biennale here in, in uh, Venice. So it's, talk, it's showing as well this quiet but precise engagement of what it means to be an artist nowadays. So he's patiently building different pieces from the first room. Then you enter into another room and you go back to China in a place which is called Hotan. And in, in this, in this uh, uh, region, it's a little bit like the Far West, where people were looking for gold. Here, you, Chinese people are looking for jade. And this region is most, it's Muslim. There is many Muslim people in that, in that region, so you don't feel to be really anymore in China. It's like another culture within China, in another world. Then you enter into another uh, piece, which is about uh, Korea. And for that Biennale, he restaged uh, historical problems that students had in the past, but restaged with uh, children of protesters at the time and showing uh, and is showing how difficult it is to really relive the story. So, and then I would say maybe one of the last work is Rome, this uh, Last Supper, where the 13 characters are having uh, dinner there, and it's showing that having food, having dinner or lunch is instrumental in every country, in Italy, like in China. Everything is made around the table. Personal, uh, professional, or, or political, or whatever, everything is made around the table. And the piece is called Eat First, Talk Later. So, so it's a bit like a, the ending of the show. And just before, you had a, a piece called Horse Market. And if you look properly in this uh, piece, first you, want, you see that the, the, the painting is covered with flies showing that the artist is not painting in his studio, but always in the context, <laughs> in this horse market, which is a traditional thing in China. And if you look properly in the, this polyptych, you see that there is uh, a Muslim mosque, mosque, there is a Buddhist temple, there is a Catholic church, and there is a four things looks like a, a cross in the sky, another religion, and you understand this is uh, an antenna, for mobile phone and television, the new religion. So it's showing this uh, antagonism next to each other, all those religions that are, of course, uh, not always easy to live next to each other. Then you enter into another project in, in Israel, where he, spent, uh, he was invited to have a show in the museum there, and he made a theory about this, uh, this dislocation of a place, which is divided into two different uh, realities, uh, cultural, political, and things like this, and it's a, not a new issue, it's a historical issue that continues. And then you continue uh, to go to the second floor and then you end up to be in a room where we show a body of painted photos because he's making a lot of photos when he's making all his projects, shooting the, the, the characters, the scene, the landscape, the context. And for the first time he's showing 24 painted and painted photos that are really interesting because it's like any of those subjects are never closed. Then you have the last step, which are as important as the rest, are the films. As I said at the beginning, all those works, all these works are always accompanied. Each series, every expedition is doing in any context, as always, this film component. The show is to give back to his work the importance of all those vocabularies, you know, put next to each other as one work and showing the importance as a unique approach toward the world, toward painting today. This work is really original too. And a very good portrait captures human expressions 
But also, I like how he leaves a lot of uh, uh, space around. Uh, Joe. Yeah. Um, did he go all around the world, or is he imagining that he was going all around uh, the world yeah, painting these? Yeah. He actually did go all around the world. He did go around. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah, he's good pan. Really good pan. Yeah. yeah. I liked him the best yeah. so far. All right. So we're looking for uh, uh, Skyladder. Skyladder, what is it? So Skyladder. Yi 慢慢的中国人就把这个研究用在了欢乐的上面。他创造了很多美好的夜晚。Legendary artist Saigo Shang is the talk of the contemporary art scene with his art blowing up all over the world. A retrospective of his works at the Guggenheim Museum in New York brought in record numbers. The Olympics opening ceremony is right around the corner, and as the creative visual force behind it, Saigo Chang spent years working up to this point. <音><音><音> 但它是软的
，太轻啊啊，太太重了，我怕你拉不动。对对对，我给店员讲啊，那气就降下来，然后他放下来一个的，把这个东西勾在它上面，啊、对吧？彼とよく話するんだけども、彼はいつも美術の作品には失敗も成功もない。まあ少なくとも彼の作品に関してはプロジェクトに関しては失敗も成功もない。いつも困ったなと思うようなことがたくさんあればあるほど実は楽しい。スカイラダーというのは何回も失敗してますよ。ぜひ。ここであの地球から宇宙に向かってはしごを作っていきたいと思います。この窓から見えるのその外のまあ丘の上の芝生の空き地あるんですよね。それはキャンパスとしてその上に東海線をつながってずっとまあ空まで。天国へのはしご。まあ自分今回あのまあこれの一つきっかけ考えして、そのはしごを我々人間がこの町から宇宙向かって作っていってあの外星人あるいは地球他一刚开始跟我讲的时候呢，其实他是有他的一种梦想，他一直都很着迷，并且想实现他所以一个是颜色，还有一个是打出来的那一个面积有多大，喷出来火焰。也不要那个梯子啊，都是一点一点的，啊、最好是连在一起。啊，对，如果连在一起就用这个。那怎么连呢？那就一条一条连起来了、啊。哦，<笑>不错，这个想法不错，<笑>大家都想点啊。啊，你。<笑>好看啊！这个地方就是随便做烟火，没人管。对，没人管。牛羊，牛羊啊！那你原来我们两个就要跑啊！对对对，站开一点了。Liftoff，we have a liftoff。Liftoff on Apollo Eleven。在六十年代，美国的宇航员到了月球。在当时的中国，还是一个真实的好心。我感到我未来不可能轻易走，我挺伤心的。但慢慢的理解了，艺术是我去宇宙的时空隧道。只要有机会，我就还经常
做一个梯子，这样伸进云彩里面。但这个梯子其实不是为了带我去旅游的，是我期待的对话和过程来往。第九级的浪是海啸中最大和最危险的波浪。俄罗斯油画有一张叫《九级浪》，我受到启发，展示了人类面向灾难时的最后挣扎。所以我就把自己的展览也取名叫《九级浪》。Um, controlled explosion. You'll see later on. So he's actually making uh, frame art using gunpowder, and he also does the outdoor uh, firework uh, pieces. But he does sculpture these kind of. This is this is very cool. Uh, I think his recent work does have a strong environmental subtext. Because it is perhaps China's number one problem, its environmental future. He has a deep social conscience. I think he cares about the world that sustains us all. He is, I think, trying to find that place which artists have always needed to find in Chinese society. Which is to, to to do your art with integrity, and yet not completely run off the tracks, and end up in a state of tension with the authorities. I love this one. This hole.
在宋代的时候，那多一千多年前的，有阵子泉州城这个城市发展的不大好，就去找了风水师来看。旁边山上比它更高的另外一个城市，做的像渔网，你这个城市像条鱼，不大好。结果就造了两个塔，因为有这两个塔，意思就是把网给破了。就是说，整个城市太信风水，也太信看不见的世界。我个人就是从这个地方出发，在这里长大，所以从小我的艺术里面都在寻找跟看不见的力量有关系。泉州是所有的会画画的人都一起到我们院子里面来画画。那他们是随便画，他们是说你们有一个大家互相通知，说周末在蔡国强家里面画画。但这些人都是在我爸爸的感召力来的，因为我爸爸是我们那一代大家很尊敬的一个人。If you think of Tsai's relationship with his father, the calligrapher, in some ways he, he did break away, of course. In other ways, he didn't, in the sense that a lot of the explosion pictures are very calligraphic. And one of the things that, that, that is part of the Chinese and Japanese tradition. What he just saw was he lays the gunpowder, does a drawing, lays. Um, <clears throat> lays the gunpowder, sprinkles it over the, um, whatever the support is, canvas or wood, I'm not sure. Then they lay cardboard or something to suppress it so it only burns quickly and, um, and probably very intensely just for a few seconds and it's over. But it, it, create, it scores the, uh, the canvas in unpredictable ways. Tradition in calligraphy as well as other artists is the, is the act of spontaneity that you, you do the calligraphy in one go almost uh, as, by instinct as though you're not thinking. His father, I think, was quite a traditional man. I think had a deep respect for Chinese culture. But of course, in those days, to be interested in such a thing as classical Chinese calligraphy, or art for that matter, was uh, something that was considered counter-revolutionary. Our great socialist fatherland is in a bright and splendid morning. Our great teacher, great leader, great commander, and great helmsman, Chairman Mao, is the red sun in our hearts. Well, the Cultural Revolution in China, which was largely the creation of Chairman Mao and his thinking, was that if China wanted to truly modernize, it needed to have a complete revolution. Not a revolution like America had, where we threw out the British, but a revolution that transformed society. All the remnants of feudalism had to be smashed. A great new society could only be built on the ruins of the old. It's not that hard to uh, stir young people up against their teachers and professors and fire them up in that kind of destructive idealism. <laughs> Everything that was old had to be smashed. Anybody with any connection to either traditional culture or wealth suddenly found themselves cast out. You know, literally, pianists had their fingers broken and uh, people were not allowed to perform traditional theater and that kind of thing. It was a tectonic, savage, and brutal period of China's modern history. And nobody escaped unscathed. 
，一只狗是阿恶嘅狗，啊，再我嘅狗，一日拉人家说，蔡国强，蔡国强，你们家的狗被打死了。在走去公路，伊才说迄个高铁公路走，啊在急火车往安徽边哦，在永庆拍，正在拍戏呢。啊，我讲，安尼讲，我迄只高铁拍戏，只高，这个假啥？哈，你大家人啊，大家人哦，大家人有法通只高，当然是也相信，唔顾未起，安尼只高偏啥个？大家人为了活落去，为了活活伊，就安尼只高，安尼假啥个？这个是是真实的时代。嗯、他妈妈不认识字，然后呢，奶奶又很强势，所以他在这种非常矛盾的这个家庭里面，他是长孙，他要很能够在这些家族里面能够窝衔。这是李伟林爸爸哎呀，是啊，我伟林爸爸哎。所以他在那个书店的时候，就每个当那个书的经书店的老板经理，但是政府的，我爸爸一辈子工资从来没有拿到我们家过的。哦，都是在发在书店买书。但是他唯一的自我安慰自己的，就是说，我买的这些书啊，我虽然没有用钱来养你们养家，可是我买了这么多书，以后你们会。<笑>因为我奶奶总是生她的气，从来不拿家拿钱回家。她说她那么多书都是我的财富。所以我其实有很多财富，也有很多书。文革的时候烧掉了很多，三天三夜在我们家烧书，而且都是要晚上烧，我还帮他烧。多回忆，哎，这个城市呢，以前没有这些高楼，所以我是，呃，主要在东街长大的。我太太，就是我女朋友的街，是在南街。从我们家到她家，骑自行车大概，啊、呃，八分钟到十分钟这样。干什么？何建平呢？其实我第一次见到他之前，原来是看到他在那电影里面在，在在有一个就是坏的角色这样表情。我一看完以后，对他其实印象不好。遇到他的时候。他的一个生活习惯啊，他的那个都是跟别人不一样。他采纳很有，就是 energy 很多。他从早上到晚上，密密麻麻的，一直不停的在那做。首先是啊。小时候我就感到我比较胆小和谨慎
，然后我画画都是一板一眼的，我感到我很受我父亲影响。能量是能够破坏我，过去那样认真的画画，但是他现在可以干扰我了。所以他这个城市很多爆炸、鞭炮、烟火，用在人的这个啊生活上的各种各样的 message， 就是发信，那很容易就想到了用火药，开始就用这个小孩的。这个火箭去喷画布，后来感到这样咻出去，画布就烧起来，咻。所以我通过找到火药，棒棒爆炸，使自己获得了解放。It's exploding history. You know, if you're putting gunpowder onto oil paint and blowing it up, I mean, that's literally destroying your own creation. When this is something you're taught your entire artistic life, and you're blowing it up and calling that art, calling that moment art, and that's already turning the idea of what art is on its head. The mid 80s to the late 80s was one of the most exciting periods to be in China because everything started to open up. It was the post Mao period, and people started to experiment in poetry, in art, in films, and so on. And there was quite a lot of freedom, in many ways, freer than China is today.
在中国生活很苦，他就一直想要出国，那哪怕去哪一个地方都可以，比如说他。所以我感到我的艺术到了日本，就开始纯粹起来，比较唯美的，对材料非常的敏感。I think Japanese contemporary art had a profound effect on him. This research back into materialism,、um, the purity of material, the meaning of that, reduction of the practice. So you come to this essence. 绘画线大量的时候，他们会在做艺术的时候讨论到西方的艺术怎么样。这一种做艺术的时候，一直考虑东方和西方，这个问题使我有一些啊抵抗。就是好像我去的时候，这个桌子上已经有中餐有西餐，啊，有一些混混乱。那在想能不能无视这个桌子。或者能不能把这个桌子的桌布，这样，所以就自己想象外星人怎么样，外星人怎么样，从外太空宇宙看我们地球怎么样。下你就知道我要什么东西。那这样一尊，然后这都都有一个弯嘛，对不对？那这些有一些船。对，好的。的有神奇感，这地方有神奇感，在很多地方它缺乏神奇感，就是所谓的我心目中一个仪感。就这个渔村，保持那个童年一点的对渔村的感情。嗯、奶奶的渔村是我想象天地的地方，但几年前的开发已经把把那给破坏了。我想找一个有同样神奇感的地方。
。哦，奶奶一直是我家的顶梁柱。我还很小的时候，她就认定我将来一定是不得了的艺术家。我想为她做这个前提。おばあちゃん、大切にしてるのは当然もちろん彼の心の中にあることですよ。あるまで、おばあちゃんが象徴している自分の子供の時。自分の街をおばあちゃんが象徴している。哇！想安来了哇！嘿嘿嘿，想安来了哇！我想安。啊，扛起扛起，你要做扛起啊，一下就认得出国强啊！你要做扛起啊，国强是你的大孙呢，你大孙呢？谁像你这么厉害啊？一百岁啊！啊，要甲你用哦，请你去看我的作品哦，看我的作品，帮一个天推，要甲你，你去咱娘渔渔村的哦，去咱娘乡里的。你我俩伫咧海边咧做作品俩，请你去看哦，啊辛苦，辛苦啊！爸爸，爸爸，是我嘞，找你看嘛，妈哦，你一百岁了。应该说，在我记忆里面，他后来跟我奶奶是经常吵架的，但是但心情是相依为命，一辈子相依为命走过来，所以这一种植物人的状态。那在这边，这个样子又不能让我奶奶看到，完全不能交流这个样子，因为我奶奶的印象，她是会画画、会写字、会喝酒、会通宵啊。嗯，哎，有时候我也很不知道这样做是不是对。1990s and the early 2000s, he was an emerging Chinese artist. Maybe the first pivotal moment was um, at Mass MoCo, which was in Massachusetts. That exhibition was Sai's first really big show. I remember when I saw it, it was clear to me that Sai had arrived. You know, this combination of space and scale and invention, that was the moment. I remember hearing about the explosion events uh, well before I had ever seen an explosion event and thinking, that guy really nailed it. 
To say that the Chinese artist Tsai Kuo Shang has exploded onto the contemporary art scene is no exaggeration. That's what every artist is looking for, right, is a signature form. I, I took this material and I made it my own. Early work has begun on the largest single installation ever commissioned for Brisbane's Gallery of... A retrospective of his works at the Guggenheim Museum in New York brought in record numbers. How many explosions does it take to complete the painting? So uh, it's four o'clock. Let's see, it looks like, I'm not sure how long, but it's like we're about halfway through. We could, uh, there's no other class after this. We could continue or we could watch the second part next time. What would you prefer to do? You have to um, unmute your mic. I have to go in 15 minutes, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do the class, you know, yeah. but this is so touching me right now, what he's doing in New York. The whole yeah. thing, it's making me, I'm just crying. Why don't we go for 15 more minutes and then I'll just pick it up next time. How's that sound? Sounds good. Okay, that's good. So we'll stop at 4.15. I want to see him keep going. Yes. Right. So don't do it. Well, I'll pick it up next time. Okay. Uh, where we left off. Good. Thanks. Good. Kiss the baba. I just want to say the ending is really touching. Because he, uh, he does the sky ladder for his grandmother. <laughs> and then she died a month later. Go over what uh, different effects here. Yeah. 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 So silver falling leaves in the air. Oh. Being a contemporary artist is not necessarily coming up with the brilliant theoretical breakthrough concept. The reality is that when you have achieved the level of recognition and you have the capacity to generate resources, you tend to push the technology to another level. We have developed many innovations that have created the ability for Sai, in his way, to think outside of the box. Pixel Burst is a shell that launches in the sky, has an embedded computer chip on the inside. And with the embedded computer chip, you can control down to milliseconds the time that the shell is launched from a mortar to the time it explodes in the sky. You can connect the dots. You can create some very amazing and very large-scale abstract images. I think the work is spectacular. That's a thing contemporary artists are doing, playing on the big stage. Standing by for show in one minute. 
This sort of pop art, merging of art and entertainment is the currency of the day. The difference between the first gunpowder explosion he did to these firework shows that he is now known for. One is really just in your face challenging the status quo. The other one servicing, um, entertaining. He is such a good show. I have used him as an example of the top of the top, a very specific kind of artist. From there, you'd start like thinking about Damien Hirst, Takashi Murakami, Olafur Eliasson. That's really the top of the top. Artists that function sort of like corporations or entrepreneurs who stamp their brand on everything. You're gonna do a massive fireworks display. The permitting alone, like the power structures that embeds you in, the amount of money you need in order to do that. And that's gonna produce an ideological pressure on your work. And it's not the easiest thing in the world to turn around and bite the hand that feeds you. Do 1.5 million people in Beijing, tremendous ramping up of surveillance. People read this as a political statement, that it was an expression of state power, and it was a coordinated cultural spectacle meant to be awe-inspiring. That's a political thing that you need to talk about when you talk about how art interacts with a big event like this. His role in it is, is part of its meaning is that it was a piece of propaganda. Zhong 所以剩下了这个岛变成了这个岛是我们唯一可以身体天梯的地方所以我尽管从全国带来了我的朋友最好的七七天最好的技术总监最好的烟火师但是还是这个岛上的人他们配上中国最好的他们配上中国最好的
every time he's trying to realize a project like Scala, there we need many supports from local people. Without their help, without their passion, and without their involvement, we cannot realize it at all. Tatsumi has been technical director with Thai Studio for over 20 years. Whenever Thai is doing his projects around the world, Tatsumi will fly from Japan. He keeps saying to Thai that this won't happen. You won't be able to do it. This is stupid. The project is way too complicated. You are not going to make it. Typical, I'm going to start to want more. I hope it's not just a design style. One is the environment. The other is the can be in the image. The third thing is the environment. In this country's big events, it doesn't rely on the sea and the sea. 不再依靠敲锣打鼓，他依靠开一个玩笑，讲一个故事。嗯、先是这个影像没了，啊，那么没了以后，没有这些故事，没有这个故事以后。整个晚会就基本上很容易成为一个放烟花的晚会。我还在这干什么？好，烟火就咱们可以多一个线，环保线。这一种精神，它是可以作为一个。值得我们那个晚上成为一个转折点，而且我认为这个环保不环保，早晚要走的。这个企业和这个刘洋，他们本身都意识到这一个的那个产业的生存，他也一定要走。创意当然很好，但是我刚才前面讲过，安全性、稳定性也很重要。如果他们讲，我这我这得明确，他们这些部门都是一票否决的，我也得尊重他们的意见。但是我这里头，我给你交个底。很大程度上，有政府在帮着你在协调和服务，好厉害，你知道吧？你要在这锁链里头拿出创意来，但是唯物主义者，但事求是，你知道吧？这是这是毛主席的那个基本思想。但是来讲，我整体上上我这整体说还是服从你，支持你，但是你得遵守我们的规则。
，我看我的这些想法。对，对对对对对对对对对假如是这个情况下，因为艺术是有自由，可是很多项目上，它就是政治，它有要求。Okay, we'll stop there. Um, it's interesting to see how these various artists, um, the position they take in relation to the authorities and Chinese government, from uh, I Y Y to openly provocative and confrontative, to him being wow. much more conciliatory. Other people doesn't seem to be an issue. Uh, there are there's a whole spectrum of <coughs> positions they take. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, I, I I really like him. This guy. He's he's so cool. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but I, but I think you know after it took him fifteen years of planning the sky ladder and it was his dream, and you know there's three cancellations for weather or terrorists, whatever. But like I said, it finally happened. It's really magnificent. Um, but I, I love this all the behind the scenes. We got to do these things. And and his fireworks the display has got more and more sophisticated with the uh, electronic, with the computerized chips in them. So they could, like you said, they could time it to a microsecond to to create these orchestrated, um, uh, what do you call it, like like um, dances of of color and fireworks and create uh, shapes and patterns out there in the sky. That, uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. So. All right, so that was fun, huh? We learned. So, what the other thing I came away with is just how much innovative art is coming out of China. I mean, <clears throat> I guess still New York City, but they're definitely uh, China is definitely an epicenter of innovative, despite all the you know, oppression and everything. There's still some amazing art that's coming out of China. Yeah. Wow. So, and, and those ten were just tip the iceberg. I mean, there's so many more. Uh, yeah. So, all right, that was fun. So uh, it was uh, fun. Have, uh, I can't well, wait to two weeks. I want to see it. <laughs> so uh, go have a takeout Chinese meal for dinner now. So I want to do. <laughs> oh yes. I <laughs> <laughs> had a an exhibition at Alcatraz. Oh, he did. Yeah. Oh, cool. It's on uh, YouTube somewhere. It was. Yeah, he's been all over the place. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. He's amazing. yeah. Uh, actually, I like his more subdued ones. There's a, a yeah. lot of them are the more traditional uh, flare patterns up in the sky, but the ones where they're uh, more controlled and they're like uh, um, flowers and different temporary, it's just all temporary art. You know, you create these patterns that shift off and they're very different than yeah. traditional, you know, explosions in the air. Yeah. Well, I, I like those best. And he's done a, new, a number of those. Which are, like that one, the algae uh, remembrance, etc. I thought that was, a, that's my, like one of my favorites. And he's done a series of those around the world. Uh, so, and people are imitating him. I saw that uh, in yeah. Italy, the whole thing now, it's, it's catching on. So he's, he's, he's started it now. You'll see it all over the place, yeah. Uh, maybe he'll come to Myrtle Beach and do one. That'd be fun. Yay! <laughs> 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 um, I think dream next, on, dream on. <laughs> uh, I gotta follow up on this. There's a uh, landscape artist, uh, Andy Goldsworthy, who is a British landscape artist. There's a great documentary about him and the whole, the whole field of landscape art, losing, using natural objects to create either more permanent um, um, structures and installations or just temporary, like made out of ice, they melt and, and so on, you know, they're there for a couple hours or just leaves, float, beautiful leaves, patterns, leaves, um, um, green leaf with a bright red thing put in threads and a whole, a uh, series of these just floating down the water. And he goes where he's the guy, but lots of people have sprung up around him. So I thought, if I do, uh, uh, next time we'll focus on landscape artists, okay? Uh, okay. With, the, with a focus, like we're focusing on a guy here today, we're focused on Andy Goldsworthy. But we'll start off finishing this one, then we'll move. Because yes. it's a natural progression for what he does to landscape art. So. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, it's out, he's doing outdoor, you know, it's not natural uh, found objects, but it's, it's um, out there in the world rather than just on walls, you know, so. Uh, and I, I learned about Andy Goldsworthy when I lived in England and he had a, one of the colleges where I was teaching had a beautiful uh, campus and he had a permanent exhibit there made out of uh, uh, twigs and branches like a giant, giant uh, bird's nest, you know, you could walk into. Yeah, so. Alrighty, that's it. So um, it was fun. Have a good um, rest of the day.
Bye. You too. Bye bye. I gotta. Uh, I gotta turn off the. Uh, I remember fine. Stop recording.